Should I give everybody an extra five minutes? It's nice to be with each other, isn't it? To greet each other, to just check in. Um, it, you're welcome this morning. This is the unofficial welcome. Myron will give you the official welcome in a moment. Uh, I don't really have any announcements other than to just encourage you to keep an eye on the bulletin boards and the website and the bulletin. And as you can see, there's no black things at the bottom. The dark, bold face is usually what's upcoming. This is just regular stuff. So we're just chugging along on our regular stuff. I know that the uh, groundhog feed on Saturday went very well. Lots of people attended. Lots of, gra- uh, lots of food was eaten, I'm sure. So I'm, I'm glad that that, that went well. Um, do you have... Oh, yes. Yes, women will be meeting in the fellowship hall because the heat is back on. <laughs> I know, that's it, little things, you know. It's like it, whenever, you can, whenever you can hang meat down there, it's probably time to get something <laughs> fixed. So, uh, but I, I just wanted to welcome you all this morning uh, and encourage you to come in an attitude of worship this morning. Byron, would you begin our service today? Good morning. I apologize for my voice. Bear with. Um, With having grandchildren in volleyball and basketball basketball, and going to the cabin and teaching um, long-term sub all of January until uh, February 5th, I I was exposed. (laughs) And I got it, but it's not bad. I mean, I just sounds worse than it is. Okay, if you can believe that. I got a bridge to say. Welcome, and I hope that you feel blessed for being here. We're blessed for you being here, whether you're a visitor or long years of coming. We appreciate you being here. Like I said, this last month of January, I was um, able to long-term sub again, and I love it when you do what you love to do, um, you're not really working. And, and so in that um, long term of four classes at the high school and four classes at the middle school, um, there was an exercise that I like to give to the kids. And I've always had minutes from it, so I'm gonna use it on you very shortly, a short, brief, not the long-winded one that Byron likes to use. But this is one thing I'd like you to do. Right now, look around you and find everything that you see that is brown, that is brown. Just look behind you and look up, lots. Okay, you see everything that's brown? Okay, now close your eyes. So you're not looking around now, close your eyes. What was it around that you were looking around that was blue? Ah, now you can open your eyes. And a lot of you are looking for blue just because I said, what was it? It was only a a, um, suggestion. When you were getting ready to go to school or getting ready to go to worship this morning, what were you focusing on? Last week, things that didn't go right, the loss of your voice, (laughs) or the next week, things that may challenge you and you're not really maybe ready for. What were you focusing on? This exercise is to say, what you focus on is what you're going to get. You focus on, oh no's. You're going to see those oh no's, and they're going to push those blessings aside. But if you're looking for, I'm going to worship today. I can't wait to see the smiling faces. You're going to see them. I can't, can't wait to have a pat on the back and give a pat on the back. I had four or five. I was looking for them. That was my focus. If you believe enough and you have faith enough, you will receive enough because the Lord is here and he said, I will provide. But it's you that need to use your faith, you that need to use your belief and focus on what is great. Let's just be quick to think when I pray this morning of what is great about being here with each other and what is great about being here knowing 
the Lord is here too. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord. Thank you for the blessings we receive. Thank you for helping us to see those blessings, to realize those blessings, and know that you have a plan for our life of good, of wonderful, if we will only believe and look for it. Thank you, Father, for being here and for all that have come to worship with you. May we bless you with our worship. Amen. Hi, Jelaine. Today's scripture is Isaiah 61, real short, 1 to 4. Isaiah 61, 1 to 4. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to release from darkness the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the days of vengeance of our Lord to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, of planting of the Lord, for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. May you be blessed by the reading of his word. stand and let's sing breathe upon us holy spirit
It truly is wonderful being here with you. As the ushers come forward, I want you to think about what you're giving for and knowing that the Lord is going to bless you. But that's not why you give. We give out of gratitude. We get out of joy. We give out of what you need to feel for God's joy in you. So give with those things in mind. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for these gifts, these offerings to you. For we know, Father, through you, all things are possible. And you will bless us for believing you are at work with us. Thank you, Father, for all that you have given. Amen. Come forward. You're ready. Oh, well, before we sit down, let's pull that forward a little bit. Can we, you'll have to get up. Nope, too late. <laughs> Come sit down. Good morning, good morning. Good to see you guys. How are you doing? Good. good. All right, so I had a story I was going to tell you, but I'm not going to tell you that story. I'm going to save it for later. Because Byron shared a story, your grandpa shared a story a little thing about an exercise about looking around and seeing all the brown things, right? Did you remember doing that? Okay, so this is the story that came to mind when he told me this. So, so these scientists wanted to do an experiment on people and how they look at things and how they see things. And so they brought their people into, that they were going to test into a basketball court. And they had people on the basketball court, they were playing basketball, and they were throwing the ball back and forth to each other. And they said to this, their subjects, they said, I want you to pay attention and count every time the ball gets passed. Do you think you guys could do that? Yeah. That would be pretty simple, wouldn't it? It's not a big deal. So pass it, pass it, pass it, pass it, pass it. And they were sitting there counting it and making sure that they got them all right because they wanted to get it right. But in the middle of the experiment, they had a person run through the basketball court in a gorilla suit. Okay, do you think you would notice that? Probably. Well, here's the thing. Afterwards, they asked their subjects if they saw the guy in the gorilla suit. And you know what? A whole lot of them, most of them, didn't. Why do you think that is? Because they were counting passes. They went and they, like, like Byron said, they looked at everything that was brown and they didn't see anything that was blue. This person in the gorilla suit ran through there and they were so focused on that thing that they were supposed to be focused on, that they were told to be focused on, that they missed this incredible thing of a person running through the basketball court in a gorilla suit. Is that weird or what? So what you pay attention to is really important. Because what you pay attention to is what you will see. If you pay attention to brown things, you'll see brown things, right? If you pay attention to passing the basketball back and forth, you're going to see that. But what God wants us to pay attention to, what Jesus says to pay attention to, is pay attention to what I'm doing in the world. Don't pay attention to the other things out in the world. Pay attention to love and gentleness and kindness and all these other fruits of the Spirit. Because when you pay attention to those things, you know what? You'll see them. They'll start to show up around you. You'll see people that are being nice and kind and gentle to people, and you'll go, oh my word, 
God is right there in our midst because now because I'm paying attention, I can see it. So that's what I want to encourage you to do. Remember to pay attention to the good things that God brings into your life and you'll see God a lot more that way, okay? Let's pray together. Lord, we do want to pay attention to the right things and we do get distracted. There's a lot of stuff in this world that, that uh, catches our attention and we watch it and it's really not that great. And so we, we pray that you'd help us to keep our eyes fixed and focused upon you so that we can see all the wonderful things that you are doing. We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you guys can go down. Thank you. All right, we're going to sing again. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. I love all the adjectives describing words in this song. There's a lot of them. Please stand. Byron, thank you for that introduction to that story. You just get the wheels turning in there. It's great. Today I want to invite you to turn to the 12th chapter of Acts for our text. Um, it is, I've only got five verses listed here, but it really is the whole chapter that we have to look at here because there's just a lot going on. And we will, we will look at the whole story, but I wanted to start off with that, that introduction Acts chapter 12, the, uh, the first five verses. Luke writes 
About that time, King Herod laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. He had James, the brother of John, killed with the sword. And after he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the festival of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison and handed him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after Passover. And while Peter was kept in prison, the church prayed fervently to God for him. Like I said, we need really the whole story here. So I'm going to, if you'll bear with me, I'll, uh, just kind of move through this. The scripture we read, that just kind of gets, gets the story started for us. And, it, and we need to look at the whole story, like I said, because it is a good story. It's a wonderful story. So go back a little bit to set the context. And you, you, we go back to the point where Stephen is around and he's preaching and he's getting into these arguments with the Jews, and they end up killing him. They stone him. And after that point, the church gets scattered. They're like, okay, we got to get out of here. And they get scattered out. They start taking the word of God out into these distant places. And the resistance to them, it really starts to ramp up. And Herod gets wind of it. Now, as you read the Gospels, you know it's kind of hard to keep track of all the Herods, right? They're, they seem to be all over the place. And which one are we, are we talking about? This is Herod Agrippa, okay? He's the grandson of Herod the Great. And Herod the Great was the Herod that was around during Jesus' birth. And so Herod Antipas was in the middle there. That was, that was uh, uh, Herod Agrippa's uncle. So Luke is right, though, not to make too much of a distinction between these, these Herods. There's really not that much difference between them. They're all despots. They're all tyrants. These are not people that you really want to spend a lot of time with. They're all tied into that power structure uh, of the world. They are not on God's side in the story. And so for the sake of the story, we're not really required to sort out which Herod we're talking about. It doesn't matter. Luke he kind of probably mashes them together on purpose. So Herod, and he's complicit here with the Jewish leaders. He arrests James, the brother of John, and he has him executed. Now there's a lot of politics here that are involved with this. But the short version is that basically it makes the Jews happy. These are the Jews that are opposed to the Jesus movement. And so Herod, because he wants to court their favor and get on their good side, he goes out and finds another follower of Jesus. He looks around, who am I going to get now? And he settles on Peter. We're going to grab Peter. He throws him in jail, and he has these plans to execute him as well. Now, he's so concerned that Peter's going to get away which if you've read the earlier part of Acts, you know this happens on a regular basis. They lock him up and he somehow gets out. But he's so concerned that he, that he puts this excessively large guard on a single guy, you know, one single fisherman from Galilee. He has four squads of four soldiers that guard him around the clock, four at a time. Two of them are actually chained to him as he's in the prison. And two are guarding the door on the way out. And so this is the level of security that Herod wants to bring to this. But as we read the story, even that's not enough. What happens is an angel comes into the cell, into where Peter is, is sleeping, and basically punches him. I know that's not really what the text says. But it does say that the angel struck Peter on the side to wake him up. And the angel says, get up, you need to put on your clothes, we got to get out of here. And so Peter fumbles around, he gets up, the chains fall away, he gets dressed, and they make their way out of the prison. And it's just like everything is just opening in front of them. The great big iron exterior doors, the gates of the prison, open miraculously on their own. I've been imagining these gates would have taken multiple people to try to get open and closed, and they just swing open and they move out into the street and they find themselves in the dark of the night and the angel disappears and Peter's like what happened he's wondering he doesn't know he's like is this a dream is this a vision I'm not sure what's going on here but at this point he's standing in the middle of that nighttime street just outside the prison there's no guards to be seen and he looks around and he's like all right I guess I'll go and he takes off so he heads, 
to the house of Mary. Okay, this is Mary, the mother of John Mark. And he's outside and he starts banging on that exterior door. Now, this is probably a large house with a courtyard and everything in it. So he's knocking at the door and inside the house where all the believers were gathered, praying for him, fervently praying for him. There's a maidservant named Rhoda. I love these details. And so Rhoda comes and sees, wants to find out who's knocking at the door. And he, she hears a voice on the other side saying, you need to let me in. And she recognizes that it's the voice of Peter on the other side, the one that they'd been so fervently praying for. And in her excitement, what does she do? She runs back into the house to tell everybody that Peter's outside knocking on the door. She does not open the door. She does not let him in. She's just too overcome by the excitement of this. I love that. So Rhoda's all excited, and, and Peter's still on the other side of the door going, hello, I'm still out here. Uh, probably looking up and down the street, wondering when the guards are going to come running. And Rhoda goes off to the others in the household and tells them that Peter's just outside, banging on the door. Now, in the group, this doesn't have the impact that maybe she would have hoped, um, because they're like, oh, you're, you're crazy. You're nuts, Rhoda. Come on. It can't be Peter. It, we know Peter's in jail. We know he's locked down. We've been here praying for him all night long, and, and that is true, but we really, we're expecting him to be delivered in a much more reasonable way, not showing up in the middle of the night, knocking on the door. That's beyond our hopes. But Rhoda, she keeps insisting, yes, yes, it is Peter. Maybe in the back of her mind going, maybe I should have let him in, I don't know. But she's like, yep, it's him. We know it is. They think, okay, well, maybe it's his angel out there knocking. But it can't be Peter himself. And finally, probably because out in the distance they keep hearing Peter knocking on the door, I'm still out here. They go and they find out, and Rhoda is right, it is Peter. And so Peter comes in and they shushes them all up and says, let me tell you what happened. And she shares the story with them. And probably because he's still in the back of his mind thinking that there's guards somewhere out there that are going to come after me, he takes off to a different place. That's what Luke tells us. Now, in the chapter, Luke shifts to telling the story of how things happen in the prison after this. It shifts to Herod and the, and the powers. And there's the expected outcome, what you'd anticipate if your prisoner suddenly disappeared in the middle of the night. There's a lot of commotion, there's a search, there's finger pointing and blame uh, being ascribed. There's a consequence. In Roman times, if you let your prisoner escape, then you got their punishment. And so it's a good chance that these, these guards ended up dead as a result of this. And Luke follows this up with an account of the ultimate end of Herod Agrippa. He leaves from Jerusalem, he goes somewhere, and there's this intrigue and, and political maneuvering that happens there. If you read that in the text, you'll see this. The people of Tyre and Sidon, they're dependent on the grain that comes from Galilee. That's Herod's control there. And so they, when they come before Herod, they want to secure this favorable trade deal to get what they need. They do what a lot of politicians love, which is they blow a lot of sunshine at him. Oh, you're so awesome, Herod. We're so glad to be in your presence. And Herod, oh, he loves it. You know, he gives a speech, and, he, and they say to him, oh, this is the voice of a god. This can't be the voice of a mere mortal man. And Herod just laps it all up. He loves this. Uh, but there's a consequence to that, too. Something, when you claim that you're beyond mortal humanity, that kind of vanity and pride, you know, there's an end to that. Luke tells us, it's a matter of public record. This shows up in other sources uh, from around the time. Herod is struck down and eaten with worms. That, you know, that's not a euphemism. That's, that's a terrible way to say he's dead. He's dead. And worms ate him. And Luke wants us to know that this, this is God doing this. Very clear about it. So that's chapter 12. In a nutshell, actually Luke probably does a better job than I could about telling the story, but in basic, this is the framework of the story, but there is a bigger story behind this story, and it's a story of power. This is the power of the world that we see. This is the power of God that we see. Luke really wants to tell us something critical here, because if we don't really figure this out, <laughs> 
we don't sort this out, which power we want to align ourselves with, well, we're courting disaster. It won't end well. So let's look at the power that we find in the story. But before we do, let's, let's just speak a moment about power itself. Sometimes we get a little uncomfortable when we talk about power. Well, I'm not powerful. I don't have any power. How can I, you know, think about these sorts of things? But we don't really, we can't. We can't deny that power exists. There is power in the world, and everyone has some power. Power essentially allows people to make a decision about something and then act on that decision. All right? I have the power to do that. It doesn't take much power. But I can do it. I have that capacity to do that. It's just something around us. Think of a baby. Little infant baby. Okay, that's the least powerful creature, human creature on the planet, right? Oh. Think about it. Okay. This baby does not get to decide where it goes and how it gets there and and when it goes. They don't get to choose very much at all. But are they powerless? Hmm. I see all the parents in the room going, oh. Yeah. Okay, think about who runs the show when there's a baby in the house. All right, who gets to decide how much sleep everyone gets? All right, who, who decides when the meal time is? Who decides by throwing food at the wall what they're going to eat? All right, yeah, babies are pretty powerful when it comes down to it. And as we get older, we just start to kind of navigate through this idea of power. We lean into it, we gain some power, we might lose some power, we use that power. We move through the world making decisions, and acting on them. I don't want to put any value on power here, okay? It just is. It's the motive force that moves us from one place to another, the capacity to do things. And the more power a person can gather together and hold in their hands, the more they can do, the more that they can accomplish. But you and I both know, we all know this, that not every application of power is right, or righteous. This story shows that. There's a few types of power in this story, and there's only one power that comes out on top. And I'm not telling you anything that surprises you. This is, you're already there. We know, we know who wrote the book, so we know what's going on here. God's power wins in the end. God's capacity to make decisions and act on them is paramount. It's the top of the heap. But even though we know this, even though intellectually we we have a handle on this, maybe we're not so good about living into that truth. Other forms of power can be kind of tempting. So the first form of power that we see here in the story is political power. It starts with Herod. The story starts with Herod. That's the power of kings. And we need to set aside this idea of kings and inherited power when we talk about the Roman Empire, because that's not really what goes on. There was a lot of fluidity, a lot of variability in leadership during the Roman times. If you were born in a palace, that did not guarantee that you would sit on a throne and wear a crown. In fact, oftentimes it guaranteed the opposite, that somebody would come along and want to kill you. So that's the way the Roman system worked. There was a lot of politicking that happened in this this setting. Herod Agrippa Okay, he's part of what seems like a royal dynasty. I mean, the names just kind of trace right through that. But his rule was built on connections and politics that laced that imperial world. You see, he was a friend. Herod Agrippa was a friend of Claudius, who became the emperor. They played together in the Roman Forum and and hung out in Rome and were educated by the same people. They were chums early in their life. And so when Claudius ascends to the emperor to be emperor, he says, I'm going to... I'm going to do right by my buddy Herod, and I'm going to put him in place in Judea. He gets to be the king there because he's my friend, and I know he's going to be loyal to me. And so he puts him in place there, and and part of the story about Herod's demise, the end of his story, uh, it shows us even more politics. If you want to read that, you're you're welcome to, but there's a lot of a lot of maneuvering and angling and, and, and backdoor deals that happen here to get Herod in the position that he's in. Politics. 
Now, Herod wanted to keep the Jews, these people that he was supposed to be ruling over, they had their own power. He wanted to keep them on his good side. And so when he realizes that killing James is maybe good for him, it's pleasing to them, he thought, well, yeah, we're going to win him over a little bit more. We're going to curry some more favor here. Let's find another follower of Jesus and execute him. That's the funny thing about political power. Okay, even though it seems like they've got it all, they're sitting at the pinnacle, they're on the throne, they still need to be careful to cultivate even more. And so Herod decides that he's going to arrest Peter and have him killed. And, and because Herod has the backing of the Roman Empire and his buddy Claudius, he's a friend of the emperor, and he sits on a throne in a palace, people probably started to get the idea that, you know, Peter's not in good shape here. This is the end of the line for Peter. Now, it's the favor of the Jews that points us to the second form of power in our story. That's a, a religious power. Because of their control over the whole religious environment, the whole religious world of the people of Judea, these Jews, and when the text talks about Jews here, we say we're talking about a specific set of Jews, the religious leaders that made up the ruling council, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the experts in the law. But these Jews were able to get things done in their setting because of their power. They could make decisions and act on those decisions. And one of the decisions that they made was that this Jesus movement was a threat. We need to do away with this. We need to squash this. We need to stamp this out. So it was what was behind all of this persecution that the followers of Jesus were suffering after the stoning of Stephen. This is, this is Saul's work before he has that remarkable encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, why he was so committed to arresting the believers, hauling them in chains into prison and breathing out murderous threats, as the text tells us. This is power, the ability to control circumstances and do things. And what we see here in this story is the alignment of two powers, political power and religious power, both of Judea and the first century. And these two powers, they've aligned themselves against the church. And it's hard to see with all that power stacked up against it, it's hard to see how the church is going to get through this. At least from a human perspective. You see, what's so interesting about this story is that we know where it's going. Right? We're not surprised by the outcome. We know where this is going. This is a story of the Spirit of God taking this good news out into the world. And do you think anything is going to be able to resist that? No. And we've been following this all along. We've been working our way through this story of Acts. We know that the Spirit of God cannot be contained. There's no way to button this down and to wrap this up and to tuck it away. It breaks out all the time in weird directions that we didn't anticipate. I mean, can you imagine Peter going to Cornelius, the Roman centurion? That's nuts. There's no way that would happen. But it did because of the power of God. So we know this. We know how it's going to play out. But as we read the story, we need to be careful that we handle it rightly this is a wonderful story and I shared some of the details with you and as you read this it's such a great story it has all these fascinating things these little offshoots that that are that are just incredible details there's that that detail of the extraordinary number of guards I mean that's an amazing piece of information there's the details of the the angel who specifically asks or really tells Peter get up put on your sandals put on your belt that's so specific, isn't it? Wrap your coat around you. Let's go. That description of the iron gate swinging open in front of them without anybody touching it. That's, that's amazing. There's Peter standing in the street. I'm out here. Somebody come open the door. That's great. Rhoda's excitement. She's overcome with so much joy. She forgets that he's still out in the street. And then Peter telling them all, say, okay, I'm going to tell you the story. Go tell James, not the one that's dead, James, the brother of Jesus, tell them the whole thing. He's become a pillar in the church, an important figure. And then that loaded epilogue at the very end of the chapter that introduces us to John Mark, 
Okay, he's going to figure into the story a lot in the, in the pages to come. So there's a lot in here, a lot, of, a lot of stories to follow in this story. And if we get caught up in those, as interesting as they are, we might not catch the powerful center of this story. So step back and ask yourself, well, what is Luke trying to tell us here? What does Luke want us to know from this story? We can set aside all of those interesting details temporarily. Go back to them and, and, and dig into them because they're fascinating. But for now, set aside all these interesting details. They give the story that special sense of authenticity. And what you're left with is a simple conflict. It's a simple conflict story. There's a, a protagonist, as they say in literature, and an antagonist. Okay, there's, a, there's good guys and bad guys. Good guys and bad guys. And since the characters of this story, they're not necessarily human characters, we do have humans who stand in for them, who represent them. On the bad guy side, who do we have? Herod, obviously. He's the bad guy, okay? But we also have the Jews. They're aligned with them, that political power against, against what's going on in the church. On the good guy side, we've got Peter, Right? And we have this praying body of believers there. They're on the good side. But these are just representatives. They're just standing there to represent the true characters of the story who are characters of power. On the one side, we've got the power of the world. And this shows up in a bunch of different ways. That political power that I talked about, that religious power, like we mentioned, of the Jews, these two very explicit forms of power, they, they, they blend together in this story, but there's other power. There's the power of confusion. Uh, the, as the believers struggle to accept that, that this might be some, actually Peter out in the street, um, there's the power of fear, which I know Peter and the, and the believers were all feeling. There's the power of doubt, the power of ridicule, the power of vanity, all of this on display. And these are all worldly powers. This is the power of the evil one. Constantly trying to trip up God's plan and God's people. But as the story shows us, the, this bad guy power, <laughs> it's no match. No match for the Spirit of God. I want you to catch this. I want you to make sure that you hang on to this, okay? It's not Peter that's powerful. Okay, you're not surprised by that, right? Okay, this is Peter in chains, bound to two soldiers, locked in a prison with multiple gates and bars in front of him. Peter is not powerful. He's just waiting for his inevitable end. That's where he's headed, his own execution. And I don't want you to get the idea that the church is powerful here, okay? Yes, they are gathered together to pray, and praying is powerful. So they're gathered together to pray for what? Luke doesn't tell us. He just says that they're gathered together to pray. They're praying for Peter, but for what? Something to do with Peter. Maybe they're praying for him to stand firm in the face of his impending execution. Hold to the faith when that blade comes down, Peter. Maybe they're praying for Herod to have a change of heart. That he'll, okay, yeah, I'll release him and it'll, it'll all be good. I don't know. Who knows? Luke doesn't tell us the content. He just says that they were praying. I don't know if they were praying for a miracle. Because look at how surprised they are when it happens. Maybe it wasn't even in their mind. Why did they think poor Rhoda was crazy <laughs> when she comes and says, hey, you've been praying, that guy you've been praying for, he's outside. Nah, you're nuts. Crazy Rhoda. Good heavens. You see, as important as it is for the church to pray, and it is important, what prayer may be doing in a circumstance like this, maybe it's bringing the body of believers into alignment with what God is already doing. We were driving home yesterday with my brother in the car, and he shared this. i got to give credit to Big Dave. He said that, that, that maybe prayer like this is a way for us to begin to resonate on the same frequency as God. That's an engineer's way of looking at things, I'm sure. But that's, it, it, it makes sense to me. We, we come into harmony with what God is actually doing 
Because the real power in this story, it's not even the power of the praying believers. Okay? The real power here, the un- unsurmountable, the unconquerable power is the power of God. You see, praying doesn't make the church itself powerful as if somehow this is something we can use to get what we want. Prayer connects the, one, the church to the one who truly has power, who has unlimited power eternal power, which I think is where we move from the story to what we're supposed to do, the descriptive part of the events to the prescriptive part of the story. Because up until now, it's been a great story, and it is a great story. And we might read it, and we might hear it, and we might say, wow, that was a great story, and then go about our lives as if nothing changed. But the Bible is not good for that. The Bible is good for instruction. And so we're supposed to learn something from this. We're supposed to get something from this. And so here's a little secret that's not really a secret. The power that freed Peter in such a wonderful and miraculous way, that power is still in God's hands. God did not lay that down at some time in the past and say, okay, I'm done. God is still doing this kind of thing. God is still enacting his perfect plan. And here's the other thing. No worldly power can stand up to it. And you can say amen to that. No worldly power can overcome the power of God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is great stuff. There's no way to overcome this power. There's no way to lock this power down. There's no way to box it up or restrain it in any way. It will break out. And that's important because we still have our Herods. There are still Herods in our lives. There are still people who are more concerned about having control, having their own power and their own position They're more concerned about that than they are what God is doing. They're more interested in securing that that sense of their own worth and their own value and having people praise them and say to them, oh, it's not the voice of a mortal man. This must be the voice of a God. And you know what? God's plan and God's power will overthrow them just as readily as it brought Herod to the ground. It is a guarantee, folks. It will happen. What Mary sings in the first chapter of Luke, that wonderful song called the Magnificat, it's still true today. Through Jesus, God has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and he has sent the rich away empty. So the prescriptive question for us, what we are to do, The prescriptive question is, which power will we align ourselves with? Do we put our hopes in the powers of the world, political power, religious power, economic power, whatever power it is, or do we, through prayer, tune into that divine frequency of God, resonating with his perfect power? So where does your hope lie? Where does your hope lie? What sort of things do we want to see come to pass in the world? What are we doing to participate in those things? Again, there's a lot of people in this story who have to learn things the hard way. When we put our hopes in the powers of this world, when we can't seem to envision anything stronger than kings and rulers and tyrants, then we're going to be disappointed because they will be eaten by worms. But if we look at the way that things really happen, what ultimately happens, if we can get on board with God's irrepressible plan, oh, Sisters and brothers, we will see miracles. Let's pray together. 
God of grace, we know that we often are distracted by the powers of this world. These things that call our attention. It's like all we see is brown when there's so much blue out there to witness. It's because it's what we're looking at. And Lord, when our eyes are fixed in the wrong direction and we're putting our hopes in the powers of this world, we pray that you would forgive us and turn our eyes and turn our hearts towards you and the unquenchable power of your love, the redemptive power of your grace. Lord, we want to follow you. We want to be involved in your plan because we know that that is the only plan that succeeds we've read the end of the story and we know how it turns out and we want to be a part of it give us the strength and the courage and take us along we pray in the name of Christ amen So one of the things that we get to do is to share in communion, which is a a blessing. And I think it's it's evidence of God's power. I mean, what does the bread represent? The broken body of Christ. What does the the cup, what do the contents represent? The, The blood that he was willing to shed. And all of that points to this glorious resurrection, this renewal, this life, the promise that we have. And if there's a miracle of miracles, it's that. And so this is a reminder of that. We do practice a believer's communion here at the Church of the Brethren. Everyone who has a saving relationship with Jesus Christ is welcome at the table. Uh, But we do want you to come prepared. I'm going to read this short reflection as we enter into a time of silent prayer. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus shared a special meal with his followers He took bread and broke it and gave it to them, telling them it was his body. He took a cup of wine and he shared it with them and he called it his blood. The bread and the cup have come to represent the infinite gift of God's perfect grace. And because we are invited to this table just as the first disciples were, we will come with hearts as ready as they can be. If you would join me. In silence, we'll prepare our hearts. Lord, in this time we have gotten ready because it's important to get ready. And we thank you for the invitation and the welcome and the miraculous, powerful reminder of your eternal love. We come to your table in the name of Christ. Amen. As the followers of Jesus reclined around the table, Jesus took a piece of bread. He held it and then he blessed it and broke it. I want you all to eat this, he told them. This is my body. We're going to pass the bread and we ask that you hang on to it until all are served and then we will share in it together.
Join me in this prayer, please. God of infinite love, we hold in our hands the reminder of your son's body, which was broken for us. We are reminded not only of the pain Jesus endured, but the way our souls are nourished by your sacrificing love. The bread reminds us of both our complicity and your forgiveness. We ask that you would bless this bread. As we thank you for the bread of life, we pray in the name of the one who allowed his body to be broken. Amen. The bread, the body of Christ, broken for us. Let's take it together. After sharing the bread, Jesus took a cup and he said to his followers, I want you all to drink this. It is my blood, the covenant blood that is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Again, we will serve the cup and ask that you hold it until we can take it together. Join me in this prayer. Lord, who brings life from death, we hold this cup filled with the reminder of the blood of Jesus, blood he was willing to pour out for many so that forgiveness can become a reality. The cup reminds us of the cost of redemption, a price you were willing to pay. We ask that you would bless this cup and help us not to hold cheaply something which cost you so much. We pray in the name of the one who laid down his life so that we might live. Amen. The cup, the blood of Christ, poured out for us. Let us take it together. if you would join me in this final prayer. Loving Father, like the first followers of Jesus we have shared in bread and in cup, we have been reminded again of the sacrifice of your Son, and we have been renewed in our commitment to you. 
This holy meal has restored us and equipped us for your service. We have felt your love and are now more ready to show it. Lead us again from this table into the world so that we may love as we have been loved. We give you the praise and the honor for you are worthy. And we pray that all of this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Amen. Marianne. Please stand. I don't know if any of you are using the hymnal, but we're not doing 430. We're doing 431, or 430 to the melody we know. <laughs> um, yeah, we're doing those words, except we'll, we're just going to follow that, Matt. Okay, how about that? <laughs> Lord, we ask a blessing on your people. You are with us as we go from here, and you will be with us as we return. You carry us, you guide us, you protect us. Pray for those that can't be with us today. We ask that you would bless them in a special way. Lord, we are free. You have released us from our bondage and our captivity. You have broken the chains and opened the doors. Help us to live it. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Sisters and brothers, you are free. You may go in peace.